the love of his people. <laughs> it's, but, but, uh, but on the other hand, uh, there have been so many times when I stood up here and I just felt God's power. So, you know, who knows? Today might be that day, right? Who knows? Who knows who might be here and behind the podium with us? Um, um, and my, my beautiful wife, Rio Ko, she, uh, she questioned the title of the sermon. Did anybody read the, the sermon title? You can't tuna fish. You can't tuna fish, right? What? She said, what, what's that all about? And I, I said, I hope by the end of the sermon it will make sense. But it is a reference to that age-old question. What's the difference between a piano and a fish? Well, you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. <laughs> so, but it is relevant to today, today's message. Uh, I have been in the church about three and a half years. I, I'm sorry for using notes. My, my mind just goes blank when I don't have notes. I, I should be able to tell this without any notes at all. <laughs> but... I've mostly been fundraising for about three and a half years, and then my uh, central figure, my commander, thought that it was time for me to go to a 21-day workshop. I think I had a couple of off days. And so I went to New York for the 21-day workshop. This was 1980, and Reverend Ken was giving the lectures. And, you know, Ken Sudo, who knows Ken Sudo? Most, most of us. Uh, he was this, he, he's been described as a little short Japanese guy with a Yoda-like face. Probably everybody's heard that, right? Uh, but he was, he was really beloved, he, everybody liked uh, Reverend Sudo, and his lectures were internal guidance. So he was explaining how do we live a life of faith? How do we do it? How do we apply these principles to our daily life? And then about a couple of weeks into the workshop, I was given the opportunity to go to Belvedere. And at that time, I had never met True Father. I'd been in the church three and a half years. I'd never met True Father. So the night before, you know, I prayed, prayed that I could meet the Messiah well. And, uh, but if I had known how his speech would be relevant to my entire life, I would have prayed all night. Uh, so we were sitting, so we went to Belvedere, we left 3 a.m. or something to get there, and we were sitting on the floor, singing holy songs, and Father walked in, like, just at 5 o'clock, and we stood up and applauded, and, you know, take it easy, guys. And so he, Father said, the title of today's speech is The Way of Abel. Okay. But something was wrong with the sound system, the microphone was not so they, the, the tech guys started working on the microphone, and Father just very informally started talking about the day before, which was Saturday, when he'd gone tuna fishing in Gloucester. And after a while, they did get the microphone fixed, but he continued with the same topic for the whole the entirety of the speech. <clears throat> um, and later, they changed the name of the title to the way of tuna. That was the name of the speech, the way of tuna. What a great opportunity for me. I'd never seen Father, but it was, it was such an interesting speech for me. You know, Father talked about, uh, he had so many ideas about how to use the ocean to feed the, the hungry people of the world. Um, the first one was fish flour, which someone, Mark or someone told me that he, created this fish flour which he gave to the UN to feed because it does, it's not perishable and you know it's got a lot of protein and it doesn't go bad and you know it can be helpful in countries that don't have enough to eat. It can be, it can be useful. So Father wanted to use fish flour. He was interested in aquaculture. This was 1980. This was long before aquaculture became a big thing, right? Uh, he wanted to do fast freezing equipment on ships. And that's something that we use now. When they catch tuna, they put them in these fast freezers and they end up in Japan, you know, a few days later. 
<clears throat> he wanted to harvest krill, krill, which is this little tiny, is it microscopic? Yeah. It's, but it's very small. And whales love it, right? But it's full of protein, and um, I guess there's an abundance of it. And I know that at one time, our brother, is his name, David Rogers? Dave Rogers? He, he was, uh, he was uh, I asked, I believe, to work on a, uh, a, a large boat that was harvesting krill. I don't know if that turned out or not, but Father asked him personally. <coughs> he talked about the idea of a mothership. He said, we can send boats out in the ocean to fish for a month or months around a mothership which can provide um, fuel and supplies. And he said, when the world is at peace, when, there's, when communism is not an issue and the world is at peace, we can use aircraft carriers for that purpose. That's one of Father's ideas. Uh, Ocean Church, uh, working with the inner city youth. He purchased, as we all know, he purchased a marina and docks and boats in Gloucester. Um, so he did that. Um, he had the idea to have a fleet of fishing boats and a chain of bait shops. So he's, so he's catching the bait and then he's selling it in the bait shops. He, and fish markets to supply Japanese restaurants. And all, you know, all, many of these things came true because brothers and sisters quietly made it happen behind the scenes. He predicted in 1980 that sushi would be hugely popular. This was at a time when most Americans ate unhealthy fast food. So it was, it was a revelation, but it was prophetic because it, it's, you know, it's kind of happened. It's happened. People are eating healthier now. <clears throat> father said that when the other fishermen saw that Father was on the water by 4.30 and he was catching all the tuna, they decided to go out 30 minutes early at 4 o'clock. But after the first day, most of them gave up. In the meantime, Father started going out at 3.30. <laughs> so they decided they could get up earlier to be Father, and he started going out at 2.30. So. And Father, Father talked in this speech a lot about just the fact that fishing life is, it makes you rugged, it makes you tough, and that's, Father felt that's the kind of spirit that we need to, uh, to save the world. It's, it's, saving the world isn't just spiritual, but it's practical as well. <clears throat> so when I got back from Belvedere, I was asked to give, um, give a report to the workshop. And so I reported what I saw. Uh, Father is charismatic, he's a prodigious speaker. He has this practical vision of how to save the world. And then, but Reverend Suda said, Reverend Sudo was, was not happy. He said, he's Messiah. <laughs> um, so, and you know, I, I respect uh, Reverend Sudo. Uh, I felt a little awkward at that time. And I, but I think also that um, some people like to emphasize Father's divinity, just like some Christians like to, to emphasize Jesus' divinity. But, for me, the most critical part about uh, Father is his humanity. And how can I be like that? But I, I do believe Father's Messiah. <laughs> I don't doubt that. Um, so, so after the speech, two years later, I was matched to this beautiful Japanese woman. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I was, um, and then in 1988, sorry, yeah, 1988, which was six, six years later than that, I uh, was invited to East Garden. We were invited to East Garden, and we, there was about 400 people there, and it was all Japanese American couples. And Father invited all of us to join the restaurant business. At that time, there were about 120 Japanese restaurants in America. Or 140. There was quite a few. Without Ryoko, I couldn't have survived in the Japanese restaurant business, at least not as long as I did, because that was 1988, and, and 
still doing that. But she translated for me, and she translated and so I could hear the language, what was going on, but more importantly, she helped me to understand the culture and the character of Japanese people, and that was critical. Um, yeah, and, and there were times when I felt like, yeah, I'm kind of Japanese, you know, I'm wearing this happy coat and you know, a scarf on my head. And I felt kind of Japanese, but I've, I've stepped back from that a little bit. <clears throat> so yeah, we, so we stuck with it. Uh, I went to Atlanta, Georgia, and I worked for Mr. Hoshino, who was, uh, was a Korean man who grew up in Japan. And a great guy, he owned five restaurants, and I worked in all of his sushi bars. And so we moved around a lot. Um, I started out at the bottom. I was a cash, I was a dishwasher. And then after about a month, I became a cashier. And then, you know, eventually I became a server. Servers are the ones in restaurants who make the best money usually. My father, when he sent us out, he said, you know, if, you know, eventually you have to open your own restaurant. And it has to be the centerpiece of the community. It has to be a place where leaders of the community meet to discuss, you know, the future of the community. So to do that, I needed to work in the kitchen, right? The kitchen is the, you know, it's the, it's the boiler room of the restaurant. I mean, that's where, you know, people are throwing dishes, and it gets it gets a little dramatic in the kitchen. But I asked Mr. Hoshino to. Oshino to send me to the kitchen, and he said, okay. And he sent me to a restaurant in Huntsville, Alabama. I worked in the kitchen for about six months making tempura. If I stayed in the kitchen, I'd probably be a good cook today, but my wife can testify that I'm not. So I just, I learned how to make tempura and, you know, some other fried uh, dishes. And after that, we had a head chef, so uh, he wasn't, the, the manager wasn't really thinking that I would make become a head chef or anything like that. But I asked him if I could make sushi, and he agreed to teach me. It was, it was a rigorous um, education because he was one of those people that he'll show you something once and then you, you're supposed to know it. So I used to come home with cuts all over my hands, you know, bandages. Um, but, I, but I did it, I learned how to make sushi. And if you're gonna own your own restaurant, that has, you, know, you need to know all the parts of the Kitchen. Otherwise, how do you know if your kitchen, you know, if your kitchen chef is uh, cheating you or something? Um, <clears throat> uh, by the way, uh, Father also said in the speech we should have Ocean Challenge, and our good friend Chris Schultz uh, created an Ocean Challenge um, program in Florida, where he would bring at-risk youth and inner city youth and take them out fishing. And it's, it's a great program. I don't know if it still exists or not, but isn't it a great idea? Yeah. <laughs> it was father's idea. Um, so how else did this father's vision affect me? Father bought uh, a marina and docks and boats in Gloucester and at that time the local people largely opposed him. The mayor was against it. And some, of the, some of the fishermen, they used to call his boat the Noho. You probably heard that, right? Mm -hmm. They referred to Father's boat as the Noho. So they, they weren't welcoming. They were kind of nasty about it. But eventually, when it became expensive, I guess, to have facilities in Boston and New Jersey, Father bought facilities in Moorhead City and Gulford on, on the coast of North Carolina. That's my hometown. Like, I'm the only church member from, from Carteret County. And, you know, but our church has a presence there. And we have our closest ally, which is Bishop Dudley and, and Minister Marion, are in Havelock, which is, you know, right there, Havelock, Beaufort, Moorhead City, all, all there together. So, I mean, everything that Father talked about came true for me personally. It affected my life. I even, uh, when we were looking for a marina, Reverend Kim was the, the um, Triangle's, uh, I guess he was the state leader, but he was here in the Triangle. And he and I, you know, went down there to look for, for, um, for locations for a marina. Um, 
We used to have a Japanese restaurant here. Uh, Little Tokyo was in Kerry, and our, our brother, Ron Takahashi, was the manager of Little Tokyo. And when I came back to North Carolina, that's where I worked. That's the first place I went before we opened our own restaurant. And it's still there. It's, uh, when True World downsized, we sold it to a Korean man. And I don't know if they changed the name, but the, the restaurant's still there. It's still open. We have a True World here in Raleigh, True World Foods. Uh, many of our, several of our brothers uh, work there. It's in Morrisville. Mr. Sasanishi works there. Mr. Katawaki works there. And Martin Savage works there. Um, okay. So here's what Father said about, um, this is something Father said in his speech, the way of Tuna. He said, Christian ministers, are very, Christian ministers are very interested in their honor and future, but I am crazy about the salvation of the world. How can I feed the world population? How can I help this nation? That is what I'm thinking about day in and day out. In the summer, your face should be tan and dark with the appearance of rugged men and women who are committed to the mission. Would you like this tough mission? Your yes doesn't sound very strong. However, today is a beautiful day, a great day for fishing. Tuna is the able of the sea. So this wasn't too far from my original topic. From Tuna, you have learned many things about my vision of the future and what fishing is all about. And then, of course, after Father went to Spirit World, Mother continued many of his humanitarian uh, initiatives uh, in Africa, South America, in the Muslim world, through the Peace Begins With Me Tour, the Sunhawk Peace Prize, Ishin Hospital, International Relief Friendship Foundation, the World Conference for Sustainable Development in the Pentagon, and the International Association for Politarians for Peace. Thank you, Mother. Um, I'm not sure what my conclusion here today is, except that when I look back over my life. You explained Akihara to us. Huh? Akihara. It's been a great success for us, yeah. Where did, how did you go from Little Tokyo to... Oh, you want to know that story? Yeah. I mean, do you want the long version or the short one? I, I'm fine with the long version, but for everyone else's sake, the short version. Okay. Um, so when I was working in Little Tokyo in Kerry, there was this Chinese woman that came in every day and she sat in the corner. And she came every Saturday, and Saturday wasn't a busy day. And takahashi san would go run errands and I would be in charge. But I would go over and talk with this uh, Chinese woman. Her name was Annie. She was pretty. And she said, I have a, I have a Chinese restaurant in uh, uh, Chapel Hill, and I'd like to add a sushi bar to it. <clears throat> and she said, uh, would you be interested in coming to work at uh, Imperial China? And she said, how much would you like? How much money would you like? <laughs> and takahashi san couldn't pay me very much money. I mean, we were just scraping by. And I told her what I wanted, and she said, okay. So I went to work at uh, a Chinese restaurant in Chapel Hill, and my best customer there was this kind of big guy. His name was Josh, young guy. And he would come in, eat sushi several days a week. I mean, when you looked at his visa bill, it was all Imperial China. And, and he, so he was my best customer, and after a couple of years, I, I felt like I needed to leave Imperial China. It was the rough, you know, it was a tough place to work because we'd start 10, 9 in the morning until 9 at night, five, six days a week. Okay, so I was, I was burnt out. And I told Josh, I, I think I'm going to be leaving. And his, his parents came in and said, would you like to, you know, we, we'd be willing to put up the capital for you to open a restaurant with one condition, Josh has to work there. And I said, I'm gonna lose my best customer, but okay. <laughs> so uh, they did, they, they funded the restaurant and after about seven years, they, they made it very easy for us to become the owners. Isn't that an amazing story? Yeah. Yeah. So that part Father didn't tell me about, but the rest of it I, I, I could see coming.
Uh, God's hand has really been guiding me all this time. Um, I, I'm not, I have no disappointments or regrets about my life. I've been deeply fortunate and, you know, I, I love being with all of you and uh, everything that led me to this day. So um, I know that means something different for every person, but I, I'm really grateful to God for my life. That's my message today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Good, good morning, Heavenly Parent, true parents of heaven, earth, and humankind. Thank you so much for meeting us here this morning. We're so grateful for everything about our lives. We're so grateful for our brothers and sisters, people that share our faith. You put us all together with a purpose, and we are so grateful this morning for that purpose, that we are here to save mankind, both practically and spiritually. May we make a determination again this morning at the beginning of a new week that we will reach out to the people around us with love, with forbearance, and realizing that it's up to us to create the heavenly world. That you, while we're waiting on you, you're waiting on us to do it. So, Father, please help us to understand how we can save this world and bring peace and happiness to everyone instead of the anguish and anxiety that, you, that we are forced to live with. Thank you very much for every blessing. We offer this time to you in the names of all the blessed central families gathered here today. Uh, Jew. Jew. Jew.